So welcome back from the coffee break. Uh, my name again is Jeff Burr from IBM Research. Uh, I'll be the uh, session chair for the rest of the, this first tutorial. Uh, and uh, have the uh, great honor of having uh, Jana Novakova here as our uh, second speaker. She is the director of product, product management at Ripple, which she first joined in 2014. Jana is responsible for XRapid, RippleNet's liquidity so solution that uses the digital asset, asset XRP. Prior to Ripple, Yana worked as a software engineer at J.P. Morgan Chase, developing their credit card infrastructure and applications. So please join me in welcoming Yana. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's, it's a pleasure being here today, and I hope you enjoy this talk. So as Jeff mentioned, my name is Yana Novikova, and I'm Director of Product Management at Ripple, the global leader in distributed financial technology. I started at Ripple four years ago. First, I was a product manager for XRP Ledger, and that's something we'll focus on in this talk. After XRP Ledger, I worked on Interledger Protocol, and Interledger Protocol is distributed ledger technology developed by Ripple to connect different ledgers together. Right now, Interledger Protocol powers our enterprise products, such as Xcurrent, Xvia, and Xrapid. And now I work on Xrapid product, an XRapid product is a RippleNet liquidity solution that allows our customers to source liquidity through XRP, Ripple Digital Asset. So what, what is Ripple? At Ripple, we work on what you would, we call Internet of Value, basically enabling the world to move, information, to move money the same way information moves today. So when you think about how we communicate in our age, we can send a message to everyone in the world almost instantly and free. So why do global payments take days to settle, cost an arm and, and a leg, and are reliable? So what Internet did for communication, Ripple is doing for payments. At Ripple, we do believe that global payments should be real-time, on-demand, at a fraction of the cost what they are today. And that's our grand vision. However, our insertion point is where we see the most opportunity and the most friction right now, and that's cross-border payments. So we are making cross-border payments more efficient by selling blockchain-based settlement solution to financial institutions, and it's a two-part solution. First, it's software, and it's also digital asset, XRP. So at Ripple, we are building RippleNet a modern global payment network infrastructure that allows financial institutions to meet demands of their customers. And those demands are constantly changing. If you think about what corporates wanted from payments in 1970s, it's very different from what, what they want today. So we sell three products to the financial institutions. Xcurrent, that allows them to process real-time payments. Xrapid, that's the product that I work on, that allows them to source liquidity on demand and Xvia, that provides a standard interface for our customers to send money globally. So let's dive into these products a little deeper before we go to XRP Ledger. So Xvia provides one standard API, one standard connectivity to the RippleNet. So network is only available as its users. Right now, if you look at the banks, payment providers, corporates, all these entities have to manage first of all, have to implement and then manage thousands of bespoke integrations into multiple networks in order to achieve a truly global coverage around the world. So Xvia provides them with this one modern API that allows them to get this global coverage with just one standard connection. And not only has this one standard connection, it also allows them to send real-time, traceable, and settlement-efficient payments. So this is Xvia. Now, a network not only needs the senders, it also needs a, somebody who's going to process those payments. And that's where Xcurrent comes in. So Xcurrent is a comp software component that our customers use at the core of their processing engines. Xcurrent, first time, first time it ever happened, that allows it, our customers to send real-time payments with end-to-end -end traceability. So the way Xcurrent works is that it's based on Interledger protocol, distributed ledger technology. And the way it's designed is that payment either completes entirely or not at all. 
And what, what it does, it eliminates the risk of delays and failures at any point of the chain. So another component that XCurrent offers to our customers and the Ripple Net offers to our customers is the rule book. The rule book to govern the network, the Ripple Net network. So six largest banks in the world came together to develop the, those rules to govern the network. And Ripple Net is the first blockchain network that actually has a rule book. So now as we have uh, senders and the processors, where does XRP and XRAPID come in? Well, not all our network members and not all, all our network participants can actually has access, have access to cheap liquidity in order to process those global payments, especially in the emerging corridors. So using XRP and XRAPID, those participants of our network who don't have access to cheap liquidity can source this liquidity through XRP, thus eliminating expensive intermediaries in FX transaction and reducing the transaction cost. So XRAPID has two value propositions. First of all, it allows our customers to source liquidity on demand through digital assets. Because digital assets settle real time, you can source, XRAPID allows our customers to do it on demand at the time of payment. The second value proposition is that it eliminates the need for pre-funded Nostra accounts. So XRAPID allows our customers not to necessarily keep fiat currencies in different destination markets where they want to send payment. Instead, they can use XRAPID and XRP, the digital asset, to source the liquidity on demand. So how does it work right now? Well, XRAPID connects to liquidity pools around the world to source the liquidity. And those liquidity pools provide liquidity against XRP, XRP Ledger Digital Asset. So here in the picture, in the, in the diagram, you can see two exchanges. So imagine we, have an, imagine we have a customer who wants to send dollars into Mexico, and they want the receiver to receive Mexican pesos. Well, the way it would work right now, the sender would have open accounts on both exchanges in the US and exchanges in, Me exchange in Mexico, and you see those two on a picture there. So um, this one originates in exchange, this is the destination exchange. The sender only needs to pre-fund dollars at the originating exchange. Say this is the exchange in, in the US. And if exchange allows real-time funding, they don't even need to pre-fund dollars there, they can just keep dollars in their bank account and the exchange will issue them credit at the time of payment. So they pre-fund the dollars at the exchange and then they use XRAPID to initiate the payment. And the way it works, XRAPID connects to the dollar exchange, it exchanges dollars for XRP, then it takes or trades dollars for XRP, then it takes XRP and withdraws them to exchange in Mexico, so here. The withdrawal from exchange in, in the United States to exchange in Mexico would only take a few seconds because the transaction will settle through XRP ledger and uh, transactions in XRP ledger settle within five seconds. So once XRP gets to exchange in Mexico, there it's, get, it's sold for Mexican peso and Mexican peso are withdrawn to a beneficiary in Mexico. So this entire payment flow only takes a few minutes. And if you use traditional rail, for example, banks or any other um, financial, traditional financial institutions, this flow would take at least a day, if not the two days. So XRAPID allows our customers to source this liquidity at the time of payment and process payments more efficiently and faster. So you, you might ask, why, X, why XRP? Why not use other digital assets for these type of transactions? Why not use Bitcoin? Well, let's, let's look at different characteristics or different um, focus areas that digital asset needs to have in order to allow for efficient settlement. So the first characteristic is transaction speed. So right now, it takes up to 45 minutes to confirm a Bitcoin transaction. And that's because of the Bitcoin ledger, Bitcoin blockchain scalability issues. So XRP transaction takes only four seconds to settle. And we'll, we'll go into detail why it takes so much faster than Bitcoin as, I, as we start looking at XRP ledger and consensus protocol. So the next category is transaction cost. So right now it costs up to 85 cents for Bitcoin transaction. XRP transaction 
on XRP Ledger is still less than a penny. And the third characteristic is throughput. So right now, Bitcoin blockchain can only process 32 transactions per second. XRP Ledger can do 1,500 transactions per second. So these are three really important characteristics that the digital asset has to possess and has to perform really well on in order to enable efficient settlement for a um, global payment system. Let's think about other characteristics, though. Another category to consider is flexibility. So for the entire world to use Bitcoin as a settlement mechanism, everybody has to adopt Bitcoin and transact Bitcoin so they can move money efficiently around the world. Well, this is not possible. With XRP, you don't need to adopt XRP. Uh, XRP can only be used as a bridge asset to tighten the spreads, to tighten the spreads among um, different fiat currencies and the world can still continue using its fiat um, currencies. The other category or the other characteristic that's worth looking at is energy, energy efficiency. So we all know that Bitcoin mining takes massive amounts of energy. So right now, to confirm Bitcoin transaction, it takes about 162 kilowatt of energy, which is enough energy to power entire house, few households for the entire day. XRP Ledger, however, XRP Ledger transactions are confirmed by distributed network of validators. In order to run a validator, it's, it takes as much energy as running an email server. So pretty much nothing. And then the last piece that it's worth looking at is stability. So we all know all these debates in Bitcoin around hard fork and um, disagreements among the core group on future of the protocol. So this is, very, this is a lot of instability for the global asset that could be used for settlement. XRP and XRP Ledger has been maintained by the same group of developers for the past several years. This is high-class, high world-class C++ develop, developers, and there hasn't been any governance issues so far. Since the inception, XRP and XRP Ledger closed 40 million ledgers today. So these are all characteristics to look at when looking at what would be the best digital asset for settlement. For settlement. So at Ripple right now, we have 270 team members. Two-thirds of them are engineers, and we have um, mem members of our team with vast, uh, majority, vast array of experiences in different industries. We are headquarters in San Francisco, in financial district, we also have offices in London, New York, Mumbai, Sydney. This is our customers. So we've been in business since 2012, and we have a vast array of customers. Uh, we work with uh, major financial institutions, payment providers, corporates, in order to move money globally. So let's, let's move to XRP Ledger. So what is XRP Ledger? Well, XRP Ledger is a decentralized cryptographic ledger for issuing, holding, transferring, and trading arbitrary assets, including its native currency, XRP, a digital asset designed for, to bridge the many currencies in the use worldwide. So this is a very, very uh, heavy definition, and I'll pack it in a bit. But before I unpack it, let's look at the history. So our original idea for XRP Ledger was proposed in 2004 by Ryan Fugger, and he called it Ripple Pay. It's a basically decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer, um, credit system. However, the development of the system didn't start until 2011, and that system was right now became XRP Ledger. So basically in 2011, Jet McCaleb and David Schwartz, De Jet McCaleb hired David Schwartz and Arthur Breeder to, solve, to, to find another way to solve double spend problem without using central authority. And what they came up with was distributed consensus protocol or distributed agreement protocol, which is used to confirm double spend problem, to, which is used to solve double spend problem. So basically, this protocol and this, this agreement is like a room full of people agreeing on something. So as long as, we, as long as the protocol agrees on what transactions to process, and as long as we know what transactions they agreed on, this solves the double spend problem. 
What they also did an, as oppo in opposition to Bitcoin, or as opposite to Bitcoin, they replaced blocks with ledgers, and they also allowed arbitrary asset, assets. And I'll go over arbitrary assets in, um, in my later um, slides. So once uh, XRP wo ledger was created, they also created 100 billion XRP, and 100 billion XRP was gifted by creators of XRP ledger, which I mentioned on the slide. They are gifted to a private US company named OpenCoin, and OpenCoin is what became Ripple. So what are ledgers? So we ha ledgers are the current state of the universe. It's, it's like the contents of the database. However, instead of having transactions, unspent uh, transaction output, which is sort of collected over time, Ledger has everything in it. And Ledgers form a secure hash in XRP Ledger network. Secure, secure hash chain, I'm sorry. So transaction sets advance the Ledger. And what it means that the prior ledgers can be forgotten. So if you ever ran Bitcoin node, or if you try to spin up Bitcoin node, you would know that it takes really, really long time for you to sync to the network. And because um, in Bitcoin, you have to synchronize all the old transactions that ever happened on a, on a blockchain in order to come to the current state. Well, in XRP Ledger, you don't have to do that. In XRP Ledger, prior transactions can be forgotten, or you can keep them if you want to keep the full history. So what does Ledger contain? First of all, Ledger contains transactions themselves, and it also contains the metadata. And metadata is description of what a transaction did. So for example, if I paid you $10, the metadata will describe that I paid you $10, and presumably the transaction succeeded and I paid you $10. And this, is, this really works for simple transactions. And it's just enough to know that transactions succeeded. So for example, if I write a check to pay someone, it's enough for everyone to know that the check went through. However, what if we have more complicated transactions? What if I pay 10 euros to somebody at the current rate, and I was willing to pay up to $12 in order for this payment to succeed? Well, in this case, just to know that transactions succeeded is not good enough. Because I don't know how much money I ended up sp spending, I don't know who took my dollars, I don't know who paid, the, who paid the euros and what the current rate was. So a more sophisticated systems, system that tracks a more sophisticated transactions can support some kind of these type of scenarios. So what are advantages of the ledgers as opposed to blocks? So ledgers ensure reliable agreement on a network state. With ledgers, you can also control the network growth. So if you don't want to keep the entire transaction history, you can discard it, and your server only needs the recent ledgers. And you can also spin up your nodes faster. So because your node doesn't have to synchronize the entire history that happened over the network, you can spin up your server way faster than um, the ones that do require to do that. So ledgers eventually come to consistency through consensus. And consensus is a distributed agreement algorithm similar to practical Byzantine fault tolerance algorithm. So what's interesting about consensus it, that with XRP ledger is that it doesn't require 100% agreement on the participants. So prior algorithms require you to agree on who's going to provide the who would be the participants in a um, in network? XRP Ledger requires substantial agreement, not 100% agreement on those participants. So what it means is that you can add and remove people without agreeing who is in and who is out. And that's XRP Ledger method of dub solving double spend problem. So transactions are applied as unit and groups. It's like a room full of people trying to agree. And one reason why it's robust is because an honest server only cares about the agreement. So if you imagine if we all try to agree what to have for lunch, well, we all have different preferences. 
Some of you might be vegetarian, some of you might not like gluten, some of you um, might be on a low-carb diet. So it would be very hard to agree because all of us have different interests, but imagine if we all cared about is agreeing. So imagine if all everybody wanted to do is to agree on a, that we want to, go, to get a place to eat, to pick a place to eat. So if, you, if somebody proposed, oh, let's go to a movie theater, well, that's not a place to eat, no. However, somebody said, let's go to a Burger King. Yes, that's a place to eat. That's, uh, let's do it. So it's a much simpler problem when different participants are aligned or they have aligned interests, but not unique interests. If they all agree on just getting the valid transaction in, that's what happens on a, during consensus on XRP ledger, the agreement is much simpler. So what's interesting about the consensus is that it can also you can also solve double spend problem through transaction ordering. Why? Because transaction is valid or not, because if transaction is valid or not, it's very deterministic. So if you want to spend money, you have to have it. Executing transaction, if it transfers money in you, which you have, it succeeds. If it transfers money you don't have, it, it does not succeed. It is very deterministic, and we can all agree on it. And transactions can either conflict or they don't. If I try to send money to two different people, we all agree that second transactions will, transaction will fail. But what's the second transaction? So I might see one transaction first and, second tra and the other transaction next. You might see the other way around. So as long as tr we order transactions in specific order, this is sufficient to solve the double spend problem. And that's exactly what validators do on XRP Ledger. They propose a set of transactions, and they avalanche to consensus. So if you think of an avalanche, it's like a snowball on the top of the roof. Once it starts tipping to one side, everybody starts pushing it towards um, in that direction, and the consensus happens. Um, the agreement comes, happens very quickly, and validators sign the ledger. So this, uh, this, it turns out that this type of consensus is very robust. And for the set of reasons that there is a much simpler problem than officially it was um, thought. One, one reason is that all honest participants will vote to include transaction if there is no reason not to include it. So if I say I want to transfer $10 to Bob, I have $10, Bob is a valid account on this network, and there is no reason why the system should not record this transaction. If everything looks fine, the, all the network participants will say, yes, this is a valid transaction, this, is, this should go in. And if transaction has any reasons not to be included, maybe it's double spend problem or something else, it's fine, it's not going to be included, and if it's, and if it's still valid, if it's still valid, then it will be included in the next round. So the consensus algorithm is biased to exclude transactions to reduce the overlap required. So what it means is that if we can't agree on the transactions, if there is a lot of them and there is a lot of disagreement, then we can reduce the amount of disagreement by, not, by eliminating transactions and by not accepting more transactions in the consensus. So that way, eventually, disagreement continuously drops, and we'll, we'll end up at a set of transactions that we agree on, we move forward, and then we'll start addressing the ones that were dropped. So what are the advantages of con consensus? Well, it has no rotating dictators. So if you think about Bitcoin and Bitcoin miners, a miner actually chooses which transactions to include in a, on a block. With consensus, there is no rotating dictators and there is no four sta stakeholders. What it means that if um, that consensus can be used for financial transactions, for financial transactions. So if you think about Bitcoin, if a person controlled all transactions that go through the network, like a miner could, then this person could benefit, could benefit, could derive some kind of benefit by doing, um, by uh, kind of um, controlling all the transactions and 
blocking some, some of the transactions. So for example, they could take the juiciest or offers or, or trade orders on the network. They could um, prevent certain people from sending, from transferring the funds. So, and that's something that's not possible through consensus because um, there is no dictators on a protocol. The other benefit of the consensus is that users can choose which validators will tr they'll trust. Consensus is fast. It's only three to five seconds to confirm transactions. Um, the reason why it's three to five seconds, each consensus round where um, validators propose transactions and agree on transactions only take five seconds. And the last but not least, obviously, is the past cannot be rewritten. And that's the advantages of the consensus. So XRP Ledger, what are the key features? Well, it's open source ISC license technology. It's a public ledger, public transactions, public history, equal access, no central authority, permissionless. It's, a, it's being worked on by a group of developers. They are world-class C++ devel developers. The XRP Ledger is written in C++. And those developers have been writing modern C++ software for the past several years. It has fast reliable confirmation, and it, has ellip it uses elliptic curve technology, it, as well as have native multi-signature support. So if we look at what, how Ledger looks, so first of all, Ledger has a sequence number or Ledger number, and we call it Ledger index. And Ledger's Ledgers are numbered incrementally. So right now, network has 40 million ledgers. And you can extract every single ledger that ever closed on the network. So you can get any of them, any of the 40 millions. So besides ledger number, ledger has, contains uh, information about accounts. And account can have certain account settings, trust lines, balances, and so on. Any changes to the ledger can only be done through a transaction. Examples of transactions could be a payment, could be a change to account settings or trust line. It could also be an offer to trade. So each transaction authorizes changes to the ledger and is cryptographically signed by account owner. Transactions are the only way to authorize changes to the ledger. Once the ledger is validated, it has a timestamp and it has a state that it's been validated. Before ledger is validated, it has a different state, such as proposed or current. So now that we know how the ledger works, or how XRP ledger works, you might start asking yourself, so how do you move assets on a payment system that is not connected to any sort of financial institution? You might imagine you have a payment system like Visa or eBay, and that's the network that has infrastructure that moves real money, and you might wonder how would you move money on a system that's not directly connected to the infrastructure that moves real money. And the answer to, to that is through virtualizing arbitrary assets. So an asset has an issuer and a currency. So let's say we have dollars issued by Wells Fargo. And because an, an asset can be issued in, by anyone, in XRP Ledger, you can only hold assets that you choose to hold. So for example, if I have a cousin who issued dollars on a network, and I don't want to hold their dollars um, because it's not very liable, I would rather hold dollars from Wells Fargo. I can choose to only hold dollars from Wells Fargo and not my cousin. In addition to that, assets have a counterparty. And what it means, at is that there is a legal obligation. So if XRP Ledger says that Wells Fargo owes me $10, well, the ledger is reporting that XRP Ledger Network knows that it's true. So, however, in addition to that, there is a separate legal obligation for Wells Fargo to owe me those $10. So presumably, if something terrible happened to XRP Ledger, that legal obligation would still exist. So there are a bunch of accounts on the network, and those are identities on the network. They all trust each other. They form a directed graph. Oh. There we go. They'll trust each other. They form a, they form a directed graph. 
And what it shows that Alice is willing to allow Carol to owe her some money, and Alice is also willing to allow Edward to owe her some money. And of course, in the real world, it would be financial institutions, but in, it could also be people. And so in the physical world, you can have money by sending money to somebody. So when Alice can send $100 to Bob, well, Bob takes his $100 and pushes electronic asset to Alice. And this electronic asset can be in any system we want. It doesn't matter. What's important is that Bob owes Alice $100, and it's a real fact. And the system recording this fact, the fact is a fact, and the fact is that Alice sent $100 to Bob. So Bob owes Alice $100. Alice has a digital asset that tells her that Bob is willing to, that Bob owes me $100. Now Alice can transfer this asset in any system we want, as long as Bob is willing to honor it. So if Charlie also trusts Bob, and Alice wants to send $100 to Charlie in any system that Bob is willing to honor, it doesn't matter who's running or who's on it, as long as Bob is willing to honor the system, Charlie can redeem those $100 with Bob. However, if you look at this um, system, it's not very usable because, as you can imagine, we have, there are so many people we all can trust, and there are so many people um, they can form this directed graph where we'll get this kind of spaghetti network uh, with large number of participants, which won't be very usable. So what's the solution to that? The solution is the hub, to have a hub. And a hub is, could be a bank. It could be another financial institution. But if there, is a, there are a lot of people that are willing to consider Wells Fargo owing them a dollar to be worth a dollar, then you'll consider it to be worth a dollar just because you know everyone else around you considers it worth a dollar. However, the problem with that, with that is that you wind up with a bunch of islands, islands of trust. You end up with Wells Fargo issuing dollars, you end up with uh, some other financial institution issuing euros, you end up with, end up with somebody issuing Bitcoin, um, company issuing Mexican pesos and so on. So now you have all these different currencies. So how do you build a global payment system out of arbitrary asset system? Well, you do it with offers. So these things, uh, this round things in the middle with double arrows around them, with, inside of them, are actually connectors. They have asset or account on both systems, on both sides of the system, and they're willing to trade it one asset for another. So if you owe dollars at Wells Fargo and you're willing to take euros for, to transfer somebody's dollars, somebody could make a payment by giving you dollars, and you, by, I'm sorry, by giving you euros, and you can transfer dollars to their account. So you can put together an international payment over, from two domestic payments. So if I want to pay someone in China, and I find somebody in China who wants to take my dollars and who wants to supply Chinese currency um, for, to my beneficiary in China, then that would work. These, those two domestic pay, payments can become one international payment from my uh, point of view. So arbitrary assets, how do they work? Well, money doesn't really move. You notice we didn't move re actual real money. What we changed, we owned, we changed, we changed who owned the money, and that's just as good as um, moving the real money. So Alice wants to pay Bob $10. What Alice wants to do, she actually wants Bob to have a title to $10. So she considers to pay them. So you don't have to move any money. You just have to swap ownership of the assets. So Sandra loses the custody, custody of the asset, recipient gains the custody of the asset. And payments in, in XRP Ledger, payments ripple through the intermediary who facilitate the payment by losing custody of the asset and gaining custody of the asset. And of course, they get benefit from doing so in the form of fees. So this is how XRP Ledger works or structured on a high level. So now that we know how it works and what's inside the ledger, let's look at consensus. So again, um, to refresh your memory, consensus is a distributed agreement protocol 
that used by XRP Ledger now work to confirm transactions. So if we look at XRP Ledger network as a whole, it's pretty much network that consists of a bunch of nodes or a bunch of distributed servers, we call them nodes, that accept and process transactions. So client applications sign transactions to, and they sign transactions and they send those transactions to nodes, which relay these transactions throughout the network for processing. So examples of client applications could be um, web wallets, could be mobile wallets, could be financial institutions, gateways, could be electronic trading platforms. The nodes that receive and process transactions may either be tracking nodes or validating nodes. So here in the picture you see blue validating nodes and white tracking nodes. Only validating nodes con contribute to advancing the larger sequence. So only validating nodes has the authority to increment the sequence and issue the new ledger on the network. So when tracking nodes accept the transactions submitted by client applications, each tracking node uses the last validator ledger as a starting point. That's always a starting point for them. And um, they accept tr transactions from client applications as candidate transactions. So those are candidates to be included. So at the start of consensus process, validators propose transaction sets. So all the blue nodes propose transaction sets. Because all the, if you look at different nodes in the network, they all have different, um, different sets. So consensus starts by validating validators' proposed transaction sets. And rather, rounds and rounds of proposals determine which transactions apply to the ledger and which must wait for the later round. So once that happens, um, nodes agree on transaction set. So nodes apply agreed upon transaction sets in this, um, in this picture shown in green to the um, last validated ledger. However, transactions which are in this case in red will not be included in the set um, and potentially will be agreed upon in the next round. And that's related to how, what I explained how if there is too much disagreement, certain transactions will be excluded from the consensus round in order to reduce the disagreement and potentially agree on those um, in the next consensus round. So each node, network node, calculates a ledger validation. So basically each tracking node applies up agreed upon transactions to the last validated ledger. And then validating nodes send their, validated, send their results to the entire network. So if you look at this picture, we had a previous validated ledger. We have a, which, which shows in black. We had a new transaction set that was agreed by all participants in the network, or mo majority. Then this, um, this transaction set, new transaction set was added to the, um, to the ledger, to the new ledger, the sequence was incremented, and that's the ledger that will be validated by the network. So ledger is considered validated when supermajority of peers calculate the same result. So all nodes compare their calculated ledger with their hashes received from chosen validators. And if it's not in the agreement, then the nodes must recalculate, uh, recalculate um, the ledger, or they have to retrieve the ledger that was proposed by validated, validators. So you might uh, ask, who are those chosen validators? Well, chosen validators is a subset of network, which is taken collectively, is trusted to not collude in an attempt to defraud the node evaluating the proposals. So the definition of trust doesn't require that each individual chosen validator is trusted. Rather, the validators are chosen based on the expectation that they will not collude in a coordinated effort to falsify data related to the network. If the network fails to achieve supermajority agreement on validators, validations, if there was too much disagreement, that implies that either there was a lot of transaction volume or there is a, the network list, there is a high network latency. So the, for consen consensus to produce um, consistent proposals. And that's why what you see if there is a lot of um, network volume, the consensus takes longer because um, it has to go through many more rounds of proposals be before the 
specific transaction set is agreed by validators. So in that case, um, consensus process just repeats um, again, and uh, it's possible that it would take more than five seconds. Again, that's, um, that's the case when there is a lot of network volume or there is a lot of latency. So network recognizes the new validated ledger version, and every node gets it. Um, every node updated the validated ledger, and the whole process starts again. So the consensus begins again with a new set of transactions, but now the, this new validator ledger be becomes the first um, ledger on the network, the, the, the one that will be applied transaction to. So and that's how consensus works. And it's time for questions. Thank you. So those who have questions for, for Jana after a talk, I think you see a first question over here. Uh, thanks. Uh, name, name and affiliation and then ask your question. Thanks. Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. Uh, when you talk about the consensus uh, validation taking place in three to five seconds because users are making that decision, who are the users? It can't be humans, I assume, so it must be some sort of proxies. And how are they validated to be able to vote? So the users on the network are validators. It's the, ser it's the servers. It's, um, um, it's, is there a Ripple Z node application or server that um, runs a validator? And um, there is a certain algorithm that allows validators to, um, to kind of to achieve the consensus. So as a follow-up, how does a node joining this network uh, get validated as being a legitimate node? Because I could see all sorts of opportunities here uh, for fraud. Yeah, so um, when, you, when you join XRP Ledger Network and you become a validator, users who use the network, they choose which validators they want to trust. So there could be hundreds and hundreds of validators. However, you might want to trust only a specific set of validators, maybe which is operated by banks. Or you might want to trust validators that are un included in the United States and not in, say, uh, North Korea. So it's up to the user which validators they want to trust. And um, that setting is um, determined in XRP, like when you run your node of XRP Ledger, um, there is a setting there where you can choose which list of validators you want to trust. So it's up to the users of the network to choose which they want to trust. And of course, there could be malicious validators, but if nobody trusts them, that they cannot do any harm to the network. How would people know they were malicious? So, as I mentioned, you, as long as the majority is not malicious, as long as you choose a group of validators that you know is not going to collude to defraud you. So it's not necessarily a single validator in, this, uh, in the group of validators needs to be trusted. It's just the group taken collectively together should be trust forfeit. And as long as um, that condition um, holds, then you should be um, good to uh, um, have a good network. I think you're being naive, but I'll give up the mic. Another question on the left. I'm Gerald. I have uh, rather a legal question. So let's assume I have an account with XRP and I have an asset. And I want to transfer that asset to a different. I want to transfer the asset to a different account. So I have an, one account and I want to transfer the asset to a different account. And let's assume the validators refuse to transfer the asset for legal reasons. For example, let's assume I'm a Chinese dissident and the Chinese validators refuse to do the transaction. So who, what legal entity is liable? that I can sue to enforce the transfer of the assets. And yeah, that, and the next question would be, what's the compensation for the validators to do the transaction and to approve of it? So the first question is, who is the legal entity that will be liable if you trust a validator that maliciously took no, it? No, 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 it's much simpler. Uh, let's assume I have an account with XRP and I cannot transfer the asset out because the validators, validators refuse to transfer the asset. 
Why would validators to refuse? Uh, to country support? restrictions. When our validators, for example, situated in China or in the U.S. or somewhere, and the mm -hmm. Chinese or the U.S. government says, you're not going to do this transaction. So just pick a different set of validators that will, um, that will transfer your asset. No, the, but there has, has to be a super consensus, no? What's that? There has to be a majority consensus. Right. So if the majority consensus doesn't happen, you will never transfer your assets. Right, that's exactly right. But then you are assuming that the majority of validators does not want to transfer your assets. That's why I'm asking who is the legal entity I can sue. That's there is no problem. legal entity in XRP Ledger network. It's a, there is no central authority to the centralized network. But well, you have to understand that's a problem because there's no legal recourse. Well, there is no legal recourse in any decentralized network. There is no legal recourse in Bitcoin or Ethereum. That might be correct, but if you want to grow and have a real business, they need that. But to the, se to the second question, uh, what's the compensation for the validator? So there is no compensation for the validators. Anyone who wants to run a validator is somebody who's interested in the stake of the network. So um, by running a validator, you can vote on network protocol changes. So if there are certain features, that are being released on a protocol, and um, as a validator, you, have a, you can vote for this feature to be included or not included in a protocol, as well as by running a validator, you participate in the network. So if, you ha if your business depends on the network, say you're an exchange or you're a wallet um, or your payment provider that uses XRP for liquidity, you have a stake to run the validator. Uh, question here. Uh, uh, Michael Shea from UC Berkeley Extension. Uh, the question here is, uh, uh, we all know the currency has been backed up by the government. Uh, your operation is uh, to guarantee the transaction will go through. Is that true? Is my understanding uh, not correct? So you mentioned the currency is backed by government? Uh, yeah, for example, like uh, U.S. dollars, uh, that's uh, I mean, backed up by U.S. government, although the dollar bill prints that in God we trust. So whichever God that the U.S. trusts, I mean, that's the guarantor, ultimately. Uh, so uh, for your operations op operating on some kind of a cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who's the ultimate guarantor? Are you asking who's ultimate guarantor to XRP or who's ultimate guarantor to the assets has been issued on XRP Ledger? Uh, all of them. All of them. Explain. So there is no guarantor to XRP. XRP is a decentralized, XRP Ledger is a decentralized network and XRP is a digital asset within the network. So there is no central authority that guarantees XRP. XRP, the XRP transactions are guaranteed by algorithm that's running behind um, XRP ledger by algorithm and cryptography. So if you're talking about the assets that can be issued on XRP ledger, those are guaranteed by the issuance bodies. So if, for example, you decide to start to, to start a gateway on XRP ledger, you can take somebody's dollars and you can issue them on a network. Then those who take those dollars, there are issu who, those who have those dollars on a network, you'll be guaranteeing that you still have those dollars to back them up. Uh, in physical world versus the digital world. So the backup uh, currency will still be the, the, the default or legacy currency. Is that what you're trying to... Explain? No, what I'm trying to say is that on XRP Ledger, you can do two different things. You can use XRP as an asset, which is decentralized assets, same as Bitcoin or Ethereum. There is no backing for... There is, there is no central authority that backs XRP. Same way as there is no central authority that backs Bitcoin. On the other hand, you can also issue fiat currencies. So XRP Ledger is not only hold, having XRP. On XRP Ledger, there are functionality where you can issue dollars or bitcoins or euros. And as long as people trust you to issue the currencies, that means they trust either your legitimate financial institution or your legitimate payment provider who wants to issue a currency on XRP Ledger, then you are the one who's be guaranteeing um, that currencies. So you can do two different you can do two different things on XRP Ledger in terms of which assets you want to use. You can use the native digital asset or you can, use, you can issue other assets. Same as you can do ICOs on Ethereum. It's very similar you can do on XRP Ledger. Okay, so just, uh, practically speaking, it's, uh, in Ethereum we trust. 
Oh, it's the same thing, like US dollars. Okay, so in X we trust. X could be anything. So XRP is backed by the cryptographic protocol. Let's try an XRP, le let's try an XRP protocol ledger. We trust. Yes, so you, you should trust in protocol and in people who develop the protocol and the, all the network that runs the protocol. Thank you. And I finally understand that in protocol we trust. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I know we have one more question. Um, and I also know that since you are all from the chip architecture area, you're all experts in organizing data flow. Uh, and what I need to do here is organize human flow because the uh, food vendor is it's going to be very cross if we all show up for lunch before 1245. In fact, I think they've been provided with a picture of the session chair. Um, so <laughs> in order to set up my own transaction for lunch, uh, what I've done is also brought up Mohan on stage. And so for those, I'm sure the next question is for Yana, but if you had a question for Mohan and you didn't get a chance to ask it, um, please come on up to the microphone uh, and we'll ask questions until um, we can all go and eat lunch. Um, so with that, i uh, ask the next question again, name and, and affiliation, and ask your question, please. Yeah, Yana, thank you. It's a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, David White, Cardware. So my question uh, relates to the cross-border payments, and the scenario you illustrated um, broke down to basically a set of local payments. Mm -hmm. How is that different from TransferWise? Um, do, so what we do different with, um, with Ripple is that using our technology, you don't have to pre-fund. So for example, right now, if you use TransferWise, the, way, the reason why TransferWise can efficiently or process your payment within probably minutes is because they have dollars pre-funded in Mexico, or not dollars, say Mexican peso pre-funded in Mexico, or they have Thai bad pre-funded in Thailand. So when you pay, when you want to send from dollars into Mexico, they just pay out from their Mexican bank account or their uh, partner Mexican bank account. So with Ripple, with, with Ripple and XRP and Xrapid, what you can do, you don't have to pre-fund those Mexican pesos in that bank account, or you don't have to pre-fund Thai bad in Thailand. So not only it eliminates the need for these pre-funded Nostra accounts, it removes these working capital requirements, as well as um, it removes your risk to FX rate, FX currency fluctuations. And you can, instead of having those pre-funded accounts, you can source liquidity through XRP, through digital asset, through um, digital liquidity pools that exist around the world. And so this is kind of what our software um, does differently for than TransferWise. However, one thing to point out is that our software is not for, it's not a consumer-based application. So somebody like TransferWise would use actually Ripple to process payments more efficiently. To you, user, it would probably be, uh, you wouldn't even know, do they use Ripple, do they use Prefund and Austria accounts, because to you, experience will be the same. However, TransferWise would be the one using our software, to, uh, using our network in order to process payment more efficiently and reduce their cost of um, doing business in, in cross-border payments. I got it. Thank you. Question on the left. Oh, thank you. Uh, may I ask a question to Dr. Mohan? Sure. Thank you. I didn't get a chance to ask uh, in the last session. Sure. Uh, uh, <clears throat> forgive uh, my ignorance. Uh, the question I had was, uh, uh, as I understood, blockchain represents a completely distributed system. That means uh, the, uh, everyone, whoever has a computer, can join and start a transaction using blockchain technology. Is that right? Not in the private blockchain. Okay. In the private pro blockchain, could we limit how many parties could participate in the transaction? As I said, I assume you were there from the beginning of my presentation? Yes. Okay. So as I said, in a private blockchain, only people who have a reason to be there, meaning they are part of a business process. On invitation only. Sorry? On invitation only? Being invited only? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Meaning, it, it's, think of the real world where there is some business process. Yes. Ignore for the time being blockchain. There's a business process that involves people. They meaning the organizations that are part of that business process, they choose to form a private blockchain network. And then it is those people 
who have come together for this purpose. It could be Apple and all its suppliers, Walmart and all its suppliers, or banks which want to work together. They form a network and they get to decide as part of that network who gets to play in it. That's it. So just because you have a laptop and you have nothing else to do, you cannot willy-nilly just become a participant in these private blockchain networks. Unlike in the public blockchain, where people just say, I'll make some money by doing this mining and all sorts of random things like that, it's kind of meaningless is my point. Um, so in the private blockchain as a result, the current participants or whoever starts the network gets to decide who is in, who is not in. And at the price of admission is also that you need to be able to, you need to reveal your identity and get a certificate and all that. So all this, you know, madness with uh, do I trust or not and all that, would you get into a car if you didn't know anything about the driver, Uber kind of situation? So, or Airbnb. So while it sounds good to talk about all this, you know, I, I let anybody from anywhere without revealing a whole lot of stuff become a participant and I'll over time build up their reputation, blah, blah, blah. Reputation without knowing identity is still a bit uh, hokey. I like your explanation. That finally made me understand. But the question here is, uh, I have had uh, this issue uh, called the scalability. How many parties can we really afford to invite so that the throughput will not be punished or penalized? Who won't be punished? Uh, no, the throughput of the system. Oh, oh, oh. So yeah, scalability is something, of course, that's currently a big focus. And so as part of that, these things are being addressed. And also the other thing to keep in mind is, I've been talking about the, let's say, the suppliers kind of situation. It could be Walmart and all the people who are supplying uh, food or whatever items Walmart is selling. Not every Tom, Dick and Harry who is a supplier will necessarily have the wherewithal to run a node and be an organization. Maybe some, you know, farmer with a small plot of land. So such people, just like in the real world, might form by grouping themselves a cooperative and the cooperative then is the representative for this group of people. And that might be the one that has a node and is an organization and these individual farmers that are part of this cooperative will become users. So things like that have to be done and this is no different from in Germany there are these itsy bitsy banks and they didn't have the wherewithal in the good old days to even run their own IT operation, forget the cloud and all that for the time being. So they formed a cooperative, and that cooperative entity became the service provider for them in terms of running their IT and things like that. So there are any number of these sorts of real world things that one can look at and learn from and do things in a way where even the scalability kind of issues. And as I said during my presentation, just because there are, let's say, thousand people in a network, that doesn't mean they're all involved in every transaction. By the notion of this uh, channel, there are subsets that are the ones that have business need to even access to certain set of uh, transactions and such. And so that also provides another mechanism, and that's what was done in version one of the Hyperledger fabric by introducing the concept of uh, channel and even restricting from a visibility perspective which members of a given network get to see what's happening with respect to certain set of transactions and certain assets that are being managed in that fashion. What? So there are various ways to skin the scat of uh, scalability, but fundamentally not having to do any of this fancy validation, this, that, is, al is already a big uh, saving in terms of uh, wasted effort and things like that that go on in the more traditional way of doing things where as I explained in gory detail in Bitcoin and such they go from day zero of the network and compute what the current balance is which is kind of maddening they don't keep a cu running current balance what, uh, then, uh, uh, thank you for explaining to me so uh, I 
finally understand a little bit better. But, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, considering all these technology, I mean, I, I understand now this is a beautiful technology. But as a business owner, why on earth I want to use that one so to allow either the bank or my mortgage owner or the government IRS, for example, uh, to have an easier time to go after my behind. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to assume that, unlike maybe some other people or whoever, uh, with ulterior motives, we all want to do things in the legit way. Given that, then the question is, what are the ways in which when things do go wrong, I can track things. By go going wrong, I don't mean somebody stealing somebody's money or whatever. Legit things like E. coli disease or whatever, you know, something that spoiled that people didn't know, or a seat belt that doesn't work, brake that doesn't work. And we want to be able to do recalls and all that efficiently rather than mass recalls. For that, the systematic way of doing bookkeeping that is the major value prop that doesn't get discussed when you just talk about few people say, sending money around and all that. Yeah. When you are really dealing with real world kinds of scenarios where this root cause analysis when something goes wrong requires knowing precisely what happened when and under what conditions. I didn't even mention the you know, famous acronym of IOT. If you listen to my presentation with the same set of slides multiple times, guess what, I wouldn't necessarily be exactly repeating the same thing. So for that reason, if you're more interested in this topic, go watch some of the other videos and you'll hear a lot more discussions about how IOTs and uh, blockchains are being combined, how AI and blockchain, we even had a panel a few months ago, there are videos of all that. And even things like stablecoin, which is an alternative to this business of converting from crypto to uh, Fiat currencies, IBM recently un uh, formed a partnership whereby there is a stable coin that's one for one, always kept in sync with the dollar. So essentially you can think of it as digital fiat currency. Right. That is just easy to do business in, but it has none of this hairiness with things changing at the will of a few people or whatever, you know. Uh, that comes into play with foreign exchange conversions and so on. It's aggravated when you have cryptocurrencies and then there's all this speculative nonsense that's going on currently, which just is mind-bogglingly awful. Supposedly, some of these people are fixing the problems with fiat currencies, values going up and down like crazy, but they in the process introduced yet another thing that's also being uh, speculatively, uh, you know, traded around and all sorts of chaos is emanating from that. So, Mohan, can I insert myself yeah. here? So, in this uh, exercise, not in, in data flow, but in human flow, I'm told that the food vendor will be almost as upset with the session chair if no one shows up at 12.45. <laughs> so, I, I would propose the following. I would propose that we divide ourselves as an audience into two parts. Those who are ready for lunch, please get up quietly and go and get your lunch, it will be outside the front door. Those who would like to continue this discussion have questions, just wait out a minute and we'll continue this, this discussion with the microphones um, while some people go and get lunch. I think most people are voting for That's lunch. That's fine. Well, in that case, in that case, if you have no, questions, No, but I, I come see, see that a yep, couple yep. of gentlemen standing But there. Let, let's, while everyone is here, please join me in thanking both speakers, Mohan and Yana. Thank you. And, and with that, since you've been waiting to ask your question, please, if you're ready with your next question. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is all from Zanix. And uh, I'm just uh, curious for one aspect. Uh, if, even if I trust all these protocols and the uh, consensus uh, mechanism, if something malicious get accidentally transferred, is there any way to <laughs> stop it and uh, minimize the damage? Well, if you only have one malicious actor, they won't be able to disrupt the consensus protocol because the majority would disagree with them and their attempt to stop a transaction would not work. Yeah, yes, I'm just saying, if we, even if the consensus it accidentally happened, let's say it's a fact, so it happened, how could, uh, is there any way to I stop I, it or minimize the fact? I think no. his question is, algorithm has a bug in it as a result of which some bad things happen. 
Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So now, yeah. once the consensus goes through and the valid, your transaction got into the, the transaction got in the ledger and the ledger is validated, there is no recourse. You cannot just re replay it or revert it back. That's the um, that's how the protocol works. In, fa okay. in fact, along those lines, people have asked us at IBM with the blockchain as a service offering. Look, it all sounds good. What if the smart contract itself had some bugs in it? This is no different from traditional database applications. A new version of the app gets rolled out. It goes and clobbers the database. You can't tell them, oh, go with, you know, bit tweezers and muck around with it to fix it up. So traditionally in the database world, we have had this notion of point-in-time recovery. So the way you do that, as you are about to install a new version of the app, you take a backup and then you go forward, and then all hell breaks loose, unfortunately. You say, tough luck, roll back to that point that was established before this new version of the app got installed, and amnesia time with respect to what happened after that. So, resubmit your transactions, whatever. Of course, this is all anathema to this whole blockchain notion that, oh, it's been cast in concrete, I can't go, you know, unwire that stuff. But customers are saying, this is not realistic enough. So don't tell me that I have to go through some other means, hoops, to somehow fix up this problem that came about. This is no different from, you know, the ATM wrongly dished out tons of money. Banks won't say, hey, you know, or whatever, you know, yeah, rockets and all that, once you fire, you may not be able to compensate it. But we have had to deal with this in the real world, and so just because it's blockchain, it has certain characteristics that turned on people, we cannot just say, hey, there's no other way to deal with this, and we have to think more practically. Well, then, of course, if it's like a huge bug that affected everyone, then our work can agree to roll back and start from, the, uh, from that point. Again, it has to be some kind of major event. If you just submit your own transactions because of your own uh, fault, that's not going to... You won't be able to just roll it back because you made a mistake. However, if there is a huge... Uh, bug in the protocol, and that's creating certain issues on the entire network. Of course, network can agree to fix it, to ch put the fix in, and then roll back potential, and then start from that point. Thank you. However, it has to be agreed by the entire network. Okay, so we would definitely like to entertain more questions, but the folks in back also need to eat their lunch. <laughs> so if we could come down to the corner here and we can chat for until these guys, you know, look totally hungry. Um, and, and we'll start the next, sec next session in, at 2 p.m. Thanks very much.